Okay, he's starting. Thank you. Hello and welcome to our Lakeside Chat. We are David Wofford and Katie Noonan, co-chairs of the Rotary Nature Center Friends. And we're so happy that you can join us tonight. As we begin our program, it is important for us to acknowledge that we are on stolen land, that Lake Merritt is part of Ohlone territory. We hear now from Corinna Gould, spokesperson for the Confederated Villages of Lashawn and co-founder of Segura Tay Land Trust. Good afternoon, relatives. My name is Karina Gould. I am the spokesperson for the Confederated Villages of Lashawn. We are here today at what most folks think of as Lake Merritt. Uh, we are in the territory of Huchin. Huchin is actually a territory that encompasses six Bay Area cities, Oakland, Berkeley, Alameda, Emeryville, Albany, and Piedmont. And so this is a place that my ancestors have been since the beginning of time. And this was a place of abundance. I'm so happy that people from all walks of life that now come into our territory can enjoy this beautiful place that my ancestors have enjoyed since the beginning of time. My relationship to the land, the land that I have been born to, raising my children and grandchildren here, has been to tell the story, the truth, of what happened on this land before other people came here. I'm hoping that as we begin to learn these lessons of fires in California, the pandemic that's happening, that human beings come back to living in reciprocity with the earth. Before we begin our, form, our virtual bird walk with our special guest, Hillary Powers, we'd like to share with you a 17 year old film we just discovered in the archives that recognizes the wonderful work of Stephanie Benavides the first naturalist of color to supervise the wildlife refuge and the nature programs that she created with Rex Burris at the Rotary Nature Center and in other Oakland parks. It highlights her impact on generations of kids and families in Oakland. Ladies and gentlemen, touch the earth. <laughs> Tessie Earth is actually one of our summer camp programs. It's sponsored by the Office of Parks and Recreation. It's part of the Rotary Nature Center, which oversees the wildlife bird refuge at Lake Merritt. And the purpose of this program was designed to give children an outdoor experience in which they could enjoy their natural resources. And when they become adults, they tend to appreciate those open spaces because They've had such fond memories of what it was like to play under the redwoods, in the trees, in the creek, with their friends, building nests, forts, whatever you want to call them, the treehouse experience, and enjoying their life as a child. Hey guys, circle! Some of the activities that we do here in a weekly, on Monday they come together, they learn about the boundaries, they get to play, they get to meet each other, they learn the songs of Touchy Earth, they have some great songs. Uh, which they'll drive their parents crazy with during the rest of the time. Thursday is our activity day. So 
you're going to see them having whatever the theme is. Tomorrow's going to be birds and mammals. This had long toes, like I said, and short claws. And he's also like the raccoon. Have you guys ever seen a raccoon? They'll be uh, pretending that they're a bird and hunting for worms in a mud tight pudding. On the count of three, are you guys ready? One, two, three. Go, go. Get messy. Oh, get messy. We're dissecting owl pellets and getting out all the bones of the animal, the jaw. Of all the rodents that they ate. We got, we got the bottom part of the jaw out of the owl pellet. And I loved that she was going every day and just playing really hard and it was structured enough so I felt like it was really safe but it was unstructured enough that it felt like it really engaged her creativity and her imagination and she was just playing all day and it felt like really like summer the way I remembered it from when I was a kid. On the campfire night we have the parents come to see their children perform. Also we do a potluck. And so this is a way of gathering the family and making them a connecting unit. That touches back on how they themselves might have had some experiences of what it was like to be picnicking or sitting out when they were a child. As people start building more and more buildings, they're looking, where's our, where's our green space to enjoy? This and the programs that we offer will help people enjoy their open space, their green space, and want to create those memories that are good memories, childhood memories, so that I will hear 30 years down the road from another child that's gone through our program. This is the best memory I ever had. I remember when, and I want that experience for my children now. That's what we offer here at the Rotary Nature Center's programs at Lake Barron. You're mute. Um, what fun. Thank you, Stephanie. Lake Mara, now, uh, Lake Mara has been blessed from the early days with local residents curious about nature and willing to share their knowledge and insights with the rest of us. Hillary Powers, volunteer with the Golden Gate Audubon Society, is such a homegrown naturalist. Anyone? who has attended her walks is drawn back by her connection to the birds and the lake and her ability to immerse us in nature in the city. During our talk tonight, the audience will be muted until the end of the virtual walk. However, the chat will be open from the beginning of the walk for you to type in your questions for Hillary for discussion. So please um, put your questions in chat. They will help make our walk richer and more enjoyable. Every five to 10 minutes, the recorded walk will pause for Hillary to respond to your questions and comments. At the end of the walk, the audience will get to unmute and ask questions after raising your hand and being recognized. So let's get going on our virtual bird walk. Hillary's waiting for us at the bird sanctuary fence. <laughs> That's not me. If you look out at the edges of the islands, the riprap on the island, that's the best place to look. We had a great blue heron sitting on one of them, and then about 30 feet away, we had a green heron sitting. And these are both very good sightings for here. Mm. The, the blue herons visit, the green herons, I'm sure, are living out there on the island, mm. but they are so timid. They, they, they stay out of sight as much as they can. Right. You know, unlike the black crowned night herons, of which we have a gracious plenty all the time. Well, this is the closest good birding spot from my home. Any place else I want to go birding, I have to drive. But I'm close enough to this to just walk on down. Golden Gate Audubon wanted to bring a birding trip down into Lake Merritt. And so they were advertising for a leader. And they got buckets. And they were advertising for a leader. They got crickets. So finally, after two or three months of this, I wrote in and said, well, you know, I don't know anything but I can show up with a clipboard and be the center of the walk. And at the same time, two other leaders had volunteered. So we wound up with all three of us. And I learned just a huge amount from Ruth and Travis. It was a wonderful thing to have done because it made a, a central source of education. Oh, look at that, look at that. That's a great egret. 
we haven't had a great egret here in a while. Ain't he lovely? We used, up until about 2006, we had a great egrets and snowy egrets both nesting on the island. And that is a wonderful thing to see if you ever get a chance to visit an egret rookery. Because they dance. You know, the, those long feathers that look like, the, that look like their tail feathers mm -hmm. on that snowy egret, they're just, you know, they sort of curl up at the end. Those aren't on his tail. They're between his shoulder blades, they start. Mm -hmm. And so when he's going to, he, she, they, they all do it. When you found your special someone and you want to persuade them to stay with you, come live with me and be my love, you dance. Mm -hmm. And all those feathers come out in a circle. So you're dancing in this silver globe. Mm -hmm. It's the most wonderful thing to see. Mm. And both the great egrets and the snowy egrets do it. Wow. It's slightly different because the plumes on the, on the great egrets are much longer, but they're straight, mm. where the ones on the, the snowy egrets curl, mm -hmm. mm. and they're, which is why they almost went extinct during the, the first big thrust of bird conservation mm -hmm. was from people who said, we don't want to be killing off entire species to decorate hats. You know, that was that was the impetus. But everything likes to sit on these on these floats. What do we have out there now? Basically, gulls and cormorants. Cormorants well, are the dark ones, right? Yeah, and they're the ones that will be nesting here on the islands. If you see the the nests up in the tree. Last year we only had nine pairs, which is just about right. That big tree there will support nine nests pretty well. When they get, when they overflow that tree, they get into the tree in front of it, which they were in the process of killing. They've killed the big tree. They sit up there and they poop it to death. Mm. So what we've got here are two gulls. When, when people see Gray and white birds like that. First thing they think is seagull. Ah, they're all seagulls. And then if they see that one of them is much smaller than the other, like these two, they think, well, there's a baby seagull. And you no, know, this both of these birds are full adults. The smaller one is a bird called a ring-billed gull, which is probably one of the best bird names in terms of you hear it, you see the bird, you go, yeah, right, that bird has a ring around its gull. That's a, that's a gull with a ring around its bill. It's gotta be, well, if you can persuade yourself that it's not a ring-billed seagull, a ring-billed gull is the natural thing to call it. But the bird that's sitting up top there, uh, if you look at that bird, that's got twice the bulk. And also it does not have a ring around its bill. It's got a red spot and it's got a black spot side by side on the end of its beak. And that's a California gull. And I wish you would stand up because one of the things when you look at a gull, you see the, the feet on the ring-billed gull are yellow. Around here we've got... Oh, yeah, look at the feet. Okay, now that's a... All right, now, now that, that bird just stood up and made me a liar. So what is that bird? Actually, you know, I think that is a... What, okay, what that is is a glaucous winged gull, probably hybridized to some extent. The thing with the big white-headed gulls, especially the big pink-legged white-headed gulls, I thought that one was going to have yellow legs, and it doesn't. So I was just wrong when I first looked at it. But we, we recognize western gulls and glaucous-winged gulls and Thayer's gulls and herring gulls, all big white-headed pink-footed gulls. And we say they're all different species. But when I was in school, they said, well, if you're a species, that means that you can't mate with anything else. And if you can mate with it, it ain't a different species. And the rules must have changed because there never was a big white-headed pink-footed gull that didn't see another big white-headed pink-footed gull and think, oh, baby, let's do it. <laughs> Actually, the fun fact I just learned about gulls, gulls eat garbage. You know, they, they go to garbage dumps. They like to pick trash. But if they've got babies, the babies get fed only the freshest of fish and little crabs. 
Gulls do not feed their own babies garbage. They feed them the good stuff because <laughs> they know what they need. So here we are back to the ring. Let's see, I don't see any, anybody has typed in questions. One thing about that brown and white bird that you just saw on the screen, uh, that was a juvenile gull. It wasn't exactly a baby. A really young gull is an amazing creature. When, once about five years ago now, we had a Western gull bring off a, a baby right on the edge of the nearest island. And you could see it, sit there and see it just after it hatched. And it was all blonde and it had, its head had big almond shaped dots all over it, like eyes. And then they were gone in a few days and then it was just kind of brown and ugly. And then about the time it learned to fly, it got the brown feathers all over it. When you see brown gulls out there, those are juveniles. And you know, gulls are what you really study after you've gotten bored with figuring out sparrows. Because it, a big gull will go through nine different plumages from the time it hatches till the time it's a grown up. And that, that's where the, my brain keeps track of. So what do we, what owls nest around Lake, Lake Merritt, somebody asks. I have never seen an owl there. There could well be great horned owls around. They seem to be everywhere in the area. Uh, anybody here knows of, has seen an, an owl at Lake Merritt, please type it in the chat line. There are about born, barn owls, Catherine, cool. cool. Boy, barn owls are nifty looking birds. I don't have a picture of one right here because I don't think of them as being Lake Merritt birds, but they've got they've that actually, wonderful flat <laughs> ghost face. The only I wanted to say that if you go to lakemerritt.org, um, there's a little um, little story about them. They actually nested at Lake Merritt over by the um, over by the uh, chalet, Lake Chalet. There was a nest and um, it was followed with some interest until the babies fledged. Some of them didn't make it, but um, there was a lot of discussion about the value of owls and the threats of, of rodenticides, et cetera, to owls. And we actually got some owl pellets from that site and there were indeed rat um, bones in them. <laughs> That's cool. That's seriously way cool. Ah, David has seen one there. Birds of prey hunting at the lake. We have, a, we, we have a red tail that likes to live around there. I think we have red-shouldered hawks nesting. I certainly see them fairly often. I know there's a Cooper's hawk nest someplace, although they left the tree where I knew they were and I don't know where they are now, but we see juvenile Cooper's hawks there from time to time. Barn owl came down one of our chimneys, someone writes. And there's been a great horned owl lately near the Rotary Nature Center. Ooh. Cool, cool, cool. Somebody, okay, Peggy saw an osprey. I saw an osprey there. Last October, there was an osprey in the trees on the near island. Ah, night heron relocation, somebody asks. Yeah, right. The night herons want to be down in downtown Oakland, where the action is. And a couple of years ago, Golden Gate Audubon, I think it was, made a spirited effort to move the great, the great, the black crowned night herons back to the island. There are a lot of them at the lake. I was down there a few weeks ago, and the whole floats were shoulder to shoulder black crowned night herons. But they put up fake black crown night herons, you know, model birds in the trees. Oh, we are birds, we are having fun. You should come here and have fun with us. And they played scrock, scrock, black crown night heron scrocks. And they did this for a year. And wow. the black crown night herons ignored them. And they did it for another year, the black crown night herons ignored them. They finally taken the fake fakes down. Wow, this is fascinating. So many stories. Um, I think we should continue a bit on our walk now. 
Yes, that. These ponds are a wonderful thing. The lake is, is salt water. It's got a, a gradient of salt water comes in at 12th Street and fresh water, when there is any, comes in down at El Embarcadero. But it's salt to some extent everywhere. And here, these ponds are, they're not just freshwater ponds. They're ponds that get drained every week or so and scrubbed out and refilled with fresh water. So it's a, a place for birds to ref really refresh themselves. The water out there is salt. And so the salt builds up in your feathers. And if you're a bird, it's big business to keep yourself clean and well-groomed and get all the little barbs and barbules of your feathers blended together. So having a place to get rid of the salt. Birds are much better at dealing with salt than we are. Many of them have got a whole separate gland in their head that pulls salt out of their blood. And they just weep pure salt, which of course we can't do, but it's still, having a place to really get clean is very important. Getting enough to eat is your most important job if you're a bird. You don't get enough to eat, you don't live till tomorrow because they run through calories, amazing. But after that, you gotta keep your tools in order and your big tool if you're a bird is your suit of feathers because without that you don't fly and you're built to fly. So looking after the feathers is big, is, is, it's work. It's what birds do when they're not eaten. You can see our Chinese goose. You see the big goose in the middle out there with a the white neck? Yep. Yeah, that's a, a domestic Chinese swan goose. There, is, there are wild swan geese in the world, but we're never going to get them here. But you can tell just looking at him that that, that bird is domestic for many, many generations back. Do you look at the difference in the way he's shaped to the way the Canada geese are shaped. The Canada goose is, of course, sort of a very smooth teardrop. And the, the swan goose is this huge, deep triangle because he and his granddaddy and his great, 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 great to the nth granddaddy were all selected to be as fat as possible in the rear end. When waterfowl were domesticated, the fat was the the big th the fat and the down feathers were what people wanted. And so that is out of sight now, but an ex a truly exquisite product of a thousand years of genetic engineering. <laughs> okay. Those ducks with the red on their faces are Muscovy ducks. And that's one of the two kinds of ducks that have ever really been domesticated, as far as I know. Certainly, almost all of the, the barnyard ducks in the world are either those guys, and they have nothing to do with Russia despite the name, they come from South America someplace, or they're mallards. And a lot of the, the, these birds here, like this guy, with the dark head and the, the yellow beak. Those, those ducks walking down to the water are mallards. And they have, you can see that there are different strain, strains of domestic duck in them. Your wild form mallard is a little duck. Almost all of these guys have got some uh, domestic parentage because all the strains, the runner ducks and the crested ducks and Except for the Muscovy ducks, all of the strains of domestic farmyard ducky wuckies all have mallard great to the nth grandparents. Oh, look and see these two mallards here. The male is much more domesticated than the female. You see how much bigger he is than she is? Uh -huh. Very, an interesting thing with the sun right here. You see how his head is blue? Oh, yeah. Most of the time when you see a mallard, his head is green. But that's a pure sun color. It's just the angle of the sun that is making his head look like that. Normally, it's a brilliant, brilliant forest green. Because there are no, there are no blues in pigments on birds. And very few, there are some rare tropical species that have a green pigment. But in most cases, both the blue and the green are what they call structural colors.
Somebody asks how the swan goose got here. Yeah, well, Lake Merritt is a famous you know, reversed kidnapping site for ducks. You get an Easter ducky and he is so cute. But a couple of weeks later, he is not so cute. And then he's pooping all over the yard. And you think, I can't live with this anymore. But the kid loves Mr. Ducky. And you can't do as your grandma would have done and have Mr. Ducky for dinner. So you say, well, we'll take Mr. Ducky to the park and we can go and visit him. And they would get, get more domestic fowl showing up at Lake Merritt because it's really easy to walk up to the fence and go poof and what? I don't have a duck anymore, what duck? So, how often are people doing this? Heaven only knows. It isn't just them reproducing at the lake. We relatively rarely see ballards with babies. And I've never seen a domestic duck with babies. There were a couple of baby Muscovy ducks there years ago, but I think that they were released as babies. Anyway. Wow, what's next on our stop, Hillary? Let's move on down the walk a little further. Okay, we're ready, Rod, for next. Um... Here we go. Good. We stopped the walk here because we had a really good look at these black and white ducks that are down in the water. Because if you look at these, all of these ducks with the gray backs and the dark heads and the white wings, that's two different species of duck you're looking at. There are lesser scalp and there are greater scalp. This guy nearest us here is a greater scalp. You see how his head flashes green when he turns? That's a pretty good, but not perfect, way of telling the two apart. This guy over here is a lesser scalp. And the only difference we're getting from him since he's got, oh, there you go. He's a lesser scalp, he's got a purple head, and the black at the end of his beak is different. A yeah. second in the water? Yeah. Yes, that's a female northern pintail. That's a really rare sighting here at the, at the lake. Uh, that's, oh, the one with the orange head is a canvas back. The one with the white head, the white back, and the rust colored head. Okay. While you've got a chance, move over and take a look at these black birds sitting on the rocks. Look at those feet. Those are American coots, and they are not ducks at all. They're a completely different genus of birds. And instead of having webbed feet, they've got these lobes along the toes, which are just the cleverest thing. You have to wonder why more birds don't do that. Because the way those feet work, when they want to swim, they can put their toes together and fill in the spaces with, between the toes with the lobes. And they swim as well as ducks. But when they get out of the water and want to run around, they spread their toes, and then they can run like chickens. Little black and one of the one of the black and white ducks, the back of his head looks like he was wearing a baseball cap and he took it off and there's a little divot in his hair. That's a lesser scalp. Yeah, that's a female scalp. Probably a lesser scalp. Because all of these black and white ones are male. The thing with ducks is that the female raises the babies more or less alone. And she needs to be very cryptic in her coloration so she can hide. The males mostly make their impression by being bright and attractive and getting the females to go with them. But also their other job is that if somebody's going to get eaten, it won't be mama with the babies. It's the male's job to do whatever is necessary to distract from the, from the females. So they're always much brighter than the females. I don't think they really volunteer to get eaten. I know Parmesan do, but Mr. Duck, as soon as he's got the, you know, the nest of, of, of eggs and they're hatched, he's not interested anymore. Of course, he's still in the area and he's much more out in the open. So I suppose if anybody's gonna get eaten, it'll be Mr. Duck, but it's not him volunteering for the purpose.
awesome, cool. Tell us about the, the black and white duck that were rescued from Lake Merritt a while back. They were a pair of uh, domestic ducks that were released at the lake over on the other side behind, behind the, the thin arm behind children's fairyland. And they lived there on that pipe for months, but eventually somebody rescued them and took them to a shelter where they, they got their, they were brought back to health and now they're living in a sanctuary. Oh, so Helen suggests, have you noticed that hybrid mallards have a tendency to be better daddies? Mallards are not all bastards. It's just that I don't think on a family show like this, I really want to talk about the life of the duck. But if you've ever seen the, the True Facts series on you know, videos on the internet, look up True Facts About the Duck. And you don't want little kids around when you watch it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, actually, Hillary, ducks in general, um, the male tends to uh, leave the female before the babies are very far along. Is that correct? And have a second family? I'm sure he wouldn't mind if he could catch one, although mm. the, in general, in the area, you know, if there's a shortage of males, so there are females that didn't snag somebody in the first round, you know, that, so, and so they're not nurse, they're not raising chicks. I'm sure he wouldn't mind. <laughs> although they have a fairly limited season. You notice that not long after the breeding season, you know, come late June into July and August, they lose their green heads. You go down to the lake and it looks like suddenly all the ducks are girls because they're all kind of an even brown color. But if you look close, you'll see that some of them still have orange beaks and some of them have bright yellow beaks. And the yellow beaks are the boys. The ones that quack are the girls. There's a little known duck fact. I once was asked to edit a book about a duck and there was a boy duck in there and he was going around quacking and it just drove me mad because male mallards do not quack. Only the females quack. What kills the baby ducks? Anything that can catch them. Wow. Baby ducks are lunch. Oh, doing. What do I think about seeing mallards in baby, baby ducklings in January? I think things are getting warmer. It's very difficult for a duck to, to bring off offspring in, in a park like this. There's just too much that wants to eat a baby duck. Why don't we go to the last video and then we can go on into a sort of unlimited questions, question section until we run out of time. Rob, can you give this video? Here we go. The white pelican that you see swimming out here is probably the bird we call Hank, which is an odd name for a female bird, but that's where you are. We have reliably reported to be female. I'm not sure how, because there's no obvious external difference between the males and the females. But in any case, Hank was brought down from Oregon because bird just cannot fly. There's something wrong, I think, with the coracoid bone in one wing, but the left wing won't spread fully. So the reason I think that's Hank is that the left side seems just a smidge higher than the right, but it's really close. There are some positions where it's easier to tell. The rule is that if you're counting birds according to the American Birding Association standards, and you come to Lake Merritt and you see one white pelican, you shouldn't count it because it's probably this rescue bird. And you're only supposed to be counting wild birds that are on habitat of their own choice. So if you see two white pelicans or five white pelicans like that bunch over there on the island, you can count the other ones. But this is not normally a white pelican habitat. When we don't have a rescue bird here, we don't see white pelicans. And in fact, they had another bird they called Helen here for 20 or 30 years. And from one year's end to the next, that bird never saw another white pelican. And they brought Hank in here, and within a year, Hank had company. 
And I thought, wow, that must be one charismatic bird. <laughs> but the better explanation for it was that Helen came from a Midwestern flyway. And Hank is from the West Coast flyway. So when the other birds from Oregon flew over, they went, oh, look at that. Hank looks fat and happy. Let's go visit cousin Hank. The birds that you see here now are most of them birds that are only here from about November through March or the beginning of April, because this is a winter destination. You know, you think about being summer, the weather is good, let's go look at birds. There are very few birds here to see, because this is club bird. It's where the birds go to keep warm during the winter. And as soon as things start to improve up on the breeding grounds, they'll take off for the long flight north. So they come here, they eat good for the winter, and then they're gone. The thing about birding, when you're just starting out, everything is such a confusion. You hear a hundred different names and you go, well, I remember that one is supposed to have a yellow beak, but was it brown? Was it gray? And you just, it, it's just, your, your brain doesn't want to reach around it. But I don't care how new you are to thinking that birds exist in the world. If you see a bird that's all gray with a kind of rosy, iridescent, shiny neck, and it's got two black wing bars, and it's walking along, you don't look at it and think, well, I see wing bars, I see pink feet, I see a rosy neck. I could look that up, oh, I bet it. No, you just look at it and you think, that's a pigeon, because you just see a pigeon the way you see a table, or you see a human being. It's just all one thing, it goes straight into your brain, and the category is right there. And the more you go out and deliberately look at birds, the more kinds of birds move from the, well, it's got wing bars, to ICA. And you can just feel your brain growing and wrapping around it. It's been one of the most exciting things to me. I only started looking at birds about, what? 15, 18 years ago now, it's longer than I think. I think of myself as a new birder because I started quite late in life. And so I can remember learning these things. I can remember when a bird clicked from recognizing the wing bars to knowing the bird. And that is just such an exciting thing. Yeah, I never get bored here at Lake Merritt. There's always something different to see. The birds that are here are different depending on the time of year. They're different depending on the state of the tide. Right now, the tide out there is as low as I've ever seen it. There is mud almost solid all the way out to the nearest island. And usually the water is lapping up against the, the, the wall of the lake. But there's always something to see. And if, even if it's the same species you've seen before, they're doing something different. You're out here after a rain and the ring-billed gulls will be out there on the lawn worm dancing. Have you ever seen a gull worm dance? It turns out that earthworms are very sensitive to vibrations on the surface. If you, my sister used to do this with her nursery school kids. You get out there with a ring of little kids and they go tick, 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 and up come the worms. And the kids go, ooh, whoa, look at that. And the gulls go, ooh, lunch. But, so there's always going to be something that is not exactly like anything you ever saw before. Well, fun fact about the cormorants, the big black birds that we were looking at. You know, you'll see them setting out and drying their wings because cormorants don't have oil. That they, their ducks oil their feathers, so they're really waterproof. Cormorants want to dive deep, and so their outer feathers get soaked. A cormorant has a layer of waterproof down under its body feathers. So they're staying warm and dry, even when they're out there diving 100 feet deep. They don't, they don't oil their feathers because they need to get under the water. So they don't want to trap that much air, but they trap enough to stay dry. We seem to have a good population of fish. Uh, the, the egrets and the, and the pelicans do well here. We've got a good solid crop of algae growing up there. You know, it looks like the dog's breakfast right now, but that's all water living plants living in the water. I see much less trash in the lake than I used to. I think that the Lake Merritt Institute is doing a good job 
of bringing people out here and keeping the whatever, keeping stuff from washing into the lake and what does wash into the lake, you know, they're getting out of it. Yeah, well, people always ask me, what's the most amazing thing you saw at the bird? And I'm at, at, at the bird, at the lake. I'm really not somebody who does favorites. I see incidents rather than, you know, of course, the rarities. I once saw a surf scoter swimming around out there. Yes, that's a, that's a, a an ocean diving duck that has no business whatsoever this far inland. So that was cool. But what I see are things that happen. I saw a crow trying to, to harass a green heron at one point. The crow was coming up and the heron. The crow leapt up and looked like he was going to dive onto the heron. And the heron stuck his beak up. Yeah, sure, guy. He'll land here. <laughs> and eventually the crow went moseying off. That's the kind of thing that I see as amazing. I see a lot of crows. I see a fair number of green herons, although I'd always like to see more of those. But when you see them doing something, that's what's interesting. That was amazing. Um, Lila Aram. So yeah. much. Yeah, excuse me, Catherine, but that video was taken by Lila Aram, who was absolutely the queen of taking video with a phone through the lens of her binoculars. Mm -hmm. And Rob, our amazing video guy, took a very grainy little telephone video and turned it into what you just saw there, which is really pretty spectacular. She was with me the day that, that we saw the, the crow and green heron incident. One thing that I wanted to add about that, I was talking about how cormorants don't have pre preen oil. They're towards the end of the, of the, of the program because that was what I believed. I mean, I read about it. I read about it in you know, Sibley's Guide to Bird Behavior. And he said that cormorants have got, you know, the, their feathers are not waterproof on the outer, out, outer part and they're waterproof in. And I figure, oh, that means the bird is wearing a wetsuit. But I just got a new, Bible of Birds, also by David Sibley. And in this one, he says that cormorants do have oil for their feathers. What they have are feathers that are in two separate pieces. I'm not sure whether I can show a picture on this and have it work, but this is the most amazing book. Yeah, here we go. So you see this feather right here that's got sort of hair on the outside and uh, barbs and barbules on the inside so that the inner part of it is waterproof and they're very dense. And so it can get water in amongst the outer edges of its feathers and not the inner edges of its feathers. And that's just totally strange. But anyway, they are, when they're out there drying their wings, they're not trying to warm up because they never get wet all the way to the skin. That's still true. But they need to get more air out of the feathers than ducks do because they want to go deeper and further. So let's see, what have people been asking here? Uh, how do we join the, the walks? Right now, the walk is very informal. Golden Gate Audubon canceled all of their walks last, all of their in-person events last March. But I just kept wandering down to the lake. I write a column on the lake for the Lake Merritt Tidings, the Lake Merritt Institute's newsletter. So I just sort of let it be known that I was still gonna show up. We met in front of the, the big globe cage on, at 9.30 on the fourth Wednesday. And we still do meet there. We're meeting now down at the end of the parking lot nearest the globe cage because they've got finally blocked off the area in front of the cage. If you're wondering why that's fenced off, we lost a birder down at once. One of, the, one of the people on my fourth Wednesday walk went into a hole by that fence up to his hips, dangling over the water. <laughs> didn't, didn't get out, get, didn't get hurt crawled out okay. It was six months later before they put the fence up, but I figure it means that they are finally going to fix that whole front 
that whole frontage there is crumbling and getting you know, more dangerous by the week. Uh, you're welcome to show up there. Uh, binoculars are good to have. It's one of the places where the birds come close enough that you don't absolutely need them. If you want to get started with birding, just open your eyes and look around. Birds are everywhere. How long ago was that particular walk? The walk with the, uh, with the heron versus the crow? Early last year sometime, late, late 2019, early 2020. I've got the date of it someplace, but I don't, don't know it off the top of my head. Someone wants Dewey and Daisy to come back to us. The lake is not really a good place for domestic ducks. They're really better off in the lovely sanctuary where they are now. We meet for the walks at the end of the gold at the parking the boathouse parking lot nearest the big geodesic dome. And I'm hoping that Golden Gate Audubon is going to be going back to in-person walks soon. The more of us that can get ourselves vaccinated. <laughs> reported the hole 16 years ago. There were different holes. There's actually a hole back out there 15 or 16 years ago that they fixed. Because I remember we had a hole, we lost another birder down that hole up to her knee. And then that one was paved over. And then the new one opened up. Do I think other species will ever show up at the lake? We're seeing birds this year, like that northern pintail that was shown in the, in the water. We wish we could get a male to come by. The male northern pintails are really amazing. They have white racing stripes up the sides of their necks. So yeah, the species mix at the lake has changed a lot. It used to be that widgeon, what they used to call mold paints, the ducks with the white foreheads were the most common duck there. Another time the pintails were most common there. But in recent, in recent years, they're gone. It's just as the, yeah, we do have more mergansers there now than before. It changes from, from year to year. I'm not altogether sure why. The double D work seemed to make a big difference in how clean the lake was and how happy the birds were. Although the Barrow's golden eyes don't spend nearly as much time down by the islands as they used to. Yes, we had a shoveler, we had a pair of shovelers there this year for a while. Actually, I thought the deal was that after the video, they were going to un unmute people so that others could try to speak. Yes, so um, that's a great suggestion. Um, and so um, thank you so much uh, for the walk. And now um, if you would like to ask a question in real time, um, we're going to ask you to raise your hand. Does everyone know how to raise your hand um, using the reactions button uh, on the bottom of your Zoom screen? And then um, you will be um, uh, asked to unmute and ask your question. Well, that's happening. Somebody has asked, what, what gets the, the feeding frenzies going? Where you get the pelicans and the gulls and the terns and then the, the cormorants uh, going mad. Uh, what you get are schools of fish. The lake is very much, it's an estuary of the bay still. Water comes in at 12th, 12th Street, often with schools of fish in it. And the more fish, the more fish eaters show up. Yeah, but Lila is feeding Hank and Hank needs fish. Oh, the other thing to know about the lake is that it's salt. And one of the things that is really heartbreaking is that people set out to go to do good deeds by buying turtles that were being sold for food and rescuing them. And they rescue them by taking them down to the lake and dipping them in salt water where the, in salt water, which poisons them, they die. Lake Merritt is not a place to put your favorite turtle. How often do least turns from Alameda show up? Very rarely. 
I've seen them there once or twice. We had a peregrine there on the, the fourth Wednesday walk in February. Peregrine came in and perched on the side of a building and looked around and flew around and it was wonderful. But that was like the second or third time I've seen a peregrine in all the years I've been going to the lake. I think we have a question from Wendy. Yeah. Um, here, thank you, Hillary. My, my question is about the red on the Muscovy ducks. I've always wondered what um, what has, you know, where does it come from? What does it do for them? The red war, warty. Well, it comes from inside the duck. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and it's like the red on a turkey. Oh, it's yeah, something that the species developed hmm. to show that I am a particularly, it's, it's not a growth. It isn't anything wrong with the duck. Yeah. It just says that I am Muscovy. Come live with me and be my love. Okay. Except they've got it all year round. It's like the waddles on a chicken or a jerky. Thank you. And a question from H. Keating. Um, is the salinity of the lake checked on a regular basis? And then are there times when the salinity is high or times when it is very low? I'm not sure whether anybody is actually doing it. The lake is tidal. And so you got salt water flowing in from one end and fresh water from the other. And it sort of depends on what's available. They're not really in a position to do much of anything about it. Hillary, um, um, I could say something about that. Um, there are, um, oh. the, the salinity of the lake right now is between 30 and 34 parts per thousand, which is really basically um, like ocean water um, because of the drought. And um, generally they're, they're not, you know, there are um, data on the lake's um, water quality parameters um, from the city of Oakland, um, from the um, uh, the um, state water boards. There, are, there's a lot of data out there. And then we just recently got um, 20 years of student collected data um, put up on the uh, San Francisco Estuary Institute um, uh, website, the CD4, C3, sorry, um, website. So. Um, there is a lot on, on there. You can see that the droughts have a big effect. Um, they have effect on the invertebrates that live there and uh, probably also on the timing and amounts of fish of various kinds there. So, um, you know, it's, uh, it's a really cool body of water. From yeah, we do get serious, ocean, serious bay fish coming in. I have seen 18 inch flatfish <laughs> swim along the bottom of the lake. Ah. Andy, do you have another question? Question, anybody? Yeah, I do. Um, what about the otters? Have you seen them lately? Saw so otters once three, four years ago. I haven't seen them lately. There was one otter that seems to have come down the creek and through the, the enclosed creek at uh, El Embarcadero and was sitting around the lake for a while. You see them up at Lake Temescal quite a lot. Yeah, but they don't make it down to Lake Merritt much. Okay. Thank you. That rays too, yeah. <laughs> There's just no end to what you can see at the lake. One of the things I'm glad we had the video with the crow and the green heron because you could see how much bigger the crow was than the heron. When the pictures were shown against the video, you had the great blue heron, and then you had the great green heron right beside it. But no, the, the green herons are actually smaller than the night herons. And if the sun is exactly right, you might see a gleam of green on one, but that's one of the, the less apt bird names out there. Oh, so thank you, everybody. We are approaching the end of our formal program, but if Hillary's uh, able, we can continue our discussion after um, eight o'clock. We'd like to take a moment in the last five minutes to um, say thank you to, uh, in addition to thank you so much for Hillary, to um, 
uh, our, our supporters and other people who have helped um, make our Lakeside Chat uh, program happen. And so I'm going to share my screen and show a few ending slides. And then if you're available, we would love to have you can um, stay afterwards and continue the discussion. Yes, so, I can stay on. That's wonderful. Okay, so here we go. And yes. Um, so uh, we are having monthly lakeside chats and next uh, next month in April on the 9th, um, we're going to have a discussion of trash in the lake and water quality featuring Dr. Richard Bailey of the Lake Mary Institute and Vanessa Pope um, from Mud Lab. So uh, we will be um, publicizing the event, the how to sign up by event grant right very soon. Next, hopefully. Yes. Okay, why are we not going down? Okay. Um, okay. All right. Um, this is annoying, to say the least. Okay. Um, so uh, I'm going to unshare and then uh, possibly I will simply share and um, I will not go into. Yeah, I will just not try to show my, my screen share. Okay, I'm going to go to share, and I'm going to go here. Oh, I know why. I think I know why now. Okay. Okay, excuse me for being... Okay, yeah, I know exactly why. Okay, so uh, we're going to go out, and Hillary, if you'd like to riff at this point, I'm going to get it up. I know exactly what's wrong. <laughs> Wonders of modern technology. Oh, yeah. Okay. So Hillary, someone wanted to know what the animal on your hat was. The animal on my hat is a ringtail. It's let's see. It's a creature that it's in the same family as, as raccoons. It's a little tree climbing. You know, did he goes. He's he's always looking for lunch someplace. I make the creatures, which is why there's always somebody around. The one on my hat, didn't find the magnet, did you? There you are. Hello, if she's still with us, I believe uh, Wendy had another question. Okay, so um, folks, we're, we have just um, located the um, problem here with the, um, with the show, and if you would not mind, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to present again, hopefully. It will go to where I want it to go. Yes, all right. So here is our next show. And next we'd like to uh, uh, give our mission statement here. Some of our activities. Our partners and collaborators without whom we could not do all of our things that we do. Here is our lineup for the spring. We'll um, be putting out our, we have um, planned um, chats going on into the summer and fall. Uh, we'd like to thank Rob Lamone, our wonderful producer, um, and uh, all of our crew for helping out on this uh, program tonight. Um, special thank you to other wonderful contributors and we thank all of the uh, bird photographers um, whose uh, work we shared tonight. And so uh, we will stop sharing right now. And now we can um, uh, say good night to people who are leaving now and thank you so much for being here, but we are able to continue um, chatting with Hillary. So uh, Hillary, go ahead. <laughs> if you have a question, raise your hand please and um, we can um, have you ask a question. So meanwhile, my sister asked me earlier, am I sitting on my balance ball here? Do you notice I move a little more than is really normal for sitting in a chair? That's because I've got my good friend here. Oh. <laughs> it's a, Joy, you got something? Me? 
Yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh, I noticed somebody asked a question about seeing dead rays along the edge of the lake. So I'm curious to know also why some rays have died, if anyone knows why. I don't myself. I think somebody guessed that it was the salinity, but it's, it's just a weird body of water. And I, I have never myself seen a dead ray. If I can try and this pulls anything out. I had a piano once. Indeed. <laughs> um, check the tidings newsletters. Um, this was in the spring of 2017 when we did have a, a very fresh year. Um, we are hoping, in fact, we are planning to have a chat speaker on sharks and rays in the bay and about rays in Lake Merritt um, who can kind of bring us up to date on what about this ongoing mystery, really. We don't totally understand what happened. So great question. Cool. Too much fresh water, yeah, that'll do it. It's the problem with not having, you know, the lake doesn't have a controlled environment. Although, have you ever seen the pumps down at 7th Street? You know, they can stop the water from the bay from getting into the lake at all. They can make it, you know, they can open it up and have it really flow in. But it was put in, I guess, after the 1930s. I've seen photographs of water up around cars around Lake Merritt yeah. before they put the controls in across the at 7th Street. I actually got this book from the library for starters. That's What It's Like to Be a Bird by David Sibley. Berkeley Library has it, Open Library probably does. I immediately turned around and, and bought it because it's the best bathroom reading I have ever come across. <laughs> you just open a page and there's a bird and fascinating fun facts about it. And it takes just about long enough. <laughs> Catherine says that she's bought copies of it. Are people with their hand up uh, wanting to ask a question? Yeah, yeah. Michelle, you have a question? Michelle Cox? No, Michelle doesn't have any questions. Okay. I think I just put them in the chat. Okay. Sorry. When did the boom start being installed at the lake, somebody asks? I would like to know that too. It's been certainly longer than I've been going to the lake, which was, uh, I moved to the Lake Merritt area in 91 after the Oakland fire. Um, this would be a good time to mention um, the book, uh, People Are For the Birds by um, Paul Covell, which is, um, a uh, good source of all kinds of information. And I, I do believe the and Jim Covell was with us, could possibly correct me, but it was in the 20s. It was shortly after um, the first bird islands were, were put out there to protect the birds during the breeding season. Louise Van Horn, do you have a question? Uh, well, I'm not Louise, obviously, but um, I wanted to ask about the crows that fly down to Adams Point. They haven't been doing it the past month or so, but earlier this earlier they were for for two or three months every evening. They would all kind of congregate above St. Paul's Towers there, and they would fly down, and then they'd all get in the trees around uh, Adams Point. And I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit about crows and what's going on there. Crows are community; they're communal birds, and when they're not actually nesting, you get lots of little family groups. Crows are much more social than many animals. You know, you've got you know, mama and papa and last year's babies and maybe the years before babies are hanging out together in a little group. And then they, all of the last year's kids and the years before kids are helping to raise the new babies. And then they just, they get into these huge flocks and it's just what crows do. These I are like a thousand crows at the same time. Oh yeah. It's part of life as a crow. 
I think being a, if you had if you couldn't be human, I think being a crow is one of the better things to choose. Crows are really quite wonderful. There's a wonderful book called Crow Planet. It's a wonderful book. Crow Planet. Yes, I, I haven't lived in this area that long, and I, I wanted to know if Adam's point was a place where crows have traditionally congregated year after year. I came from Arlington, Virginia, and there is a spot there that I take you all to before the West Nile virus showed up in which there would literally be four or 5,000 crows at one time. I don't know how long it's been going on here, but it's, it's basically what crows do. Somebody has asked for an explanation of how to raise the hand using the emojis. And I don't myself know. So if one of the, uh, here we go, says Catherine Noonan raised her hand. Uh, but I don't know what the reaction, you press the reactions button and you go, ta-da, open mouth, joy, heart, thumbs up, clap, I don't see anything on the reactions that says raise your hand. It's the bottom one, it's a, 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 across the bottom, it says raise hand. Uh, not on my screen there, right? hmm. It may say more. So on, I find that in within the chat menu, if you open up chat, then you've got a whole screen and down there it says raise hand, but it's inside of the chat. so. For oh, right. It's, yeah, it's not in reactions at all. It's down here. Yes, no, more. I don't have that at all. You don't see the chat little balloon with chat? I see the chat, so but it doesn't that. open up to any emojis or anything. Down if at the bottom. If of you the click on it, you see all the chat listed, and then you at the very bottom see a little raise hand. You yes, have no. You have to open no. reactions. Don't Mine you? are all under reactions. Yeah, reactions. Okay. Open reactions. <laughs> On reactions, I've got clapping, thumbs up, heart, laughing with tears, wow, and a, like a party thing, and that's all. Yeah, that's all. The reactions are down at the bottom of the screen uh, next to the leave the button. The, that's the one nearest the lead. Yeah, that's reactions. Those are the reactions that I have, the ones I just described. Okay. Oh, wait. Mine has two more, reactions, two more rows. And then you written. click chat. No. If you everybody click chat, has different nice. versions. Yeah, you know, sometimes it, there's different versions of Zoom. And if you don't have yeah. the latest version, it may not have that function. I think it depends, yeah, or on the computer. OK. Thanks anyway. anyway. I didn't mean to distract. <laughs> uh, not at all. Can I ask a quick question? I know I didn't raise my hand. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. And, um, I, thank you so much for everything tonight. I love hearing all this information. Um, I'm curious about the black crested night herons when their habitat was destroyed by the construction um, downtown. How are they doing? I know that there was a big push for them to move. They were putting up speakers with calls by the lake. I don't think that worked. What's the population like now? Um, and where are they living? I'm not altogether sure. They've gone to other places downtown. They like fast food joints. <laughs> <laughs> but there were two or 300 of them there a month or so ago at the lake. As I was as mentioned earlier, I saw the whole all of that, all of the floats, every float was shoulder to shoulder to shoulder to shoulder black crown night herons. You know, the world is full of black crown night herons. And when they nested, I think they're still nesting the lake to some extent because we see very young babies. And a ranger back 20 years ago told me that, well, the black crown night herons nest back in the bushes. You're not going to see them because they're hiding their nests because they're big nest robbers. And so they, they raise their babies with the sense of sin. 
by the way, if you want to raise your hand, it's actually if you click on participants, not chat. And it's at the bottom of the participants. It says raise hand, yes, no, go slower, go faster. Okay, I see. Never mind. <laughs> Never mind. Okay, I get yes, no, go slower, go faster, but I don't get raise hand. Oh, I, I get a raise hand. Okay. It's all, it's all <laughs> what you have zoomed to. <laughs> The Zoom gods make it different for everyone. <laughs> Linda, do you have a question? Your hand is raised. Linda Valley, are you? Do you have a question? Oh, that that was just a test. <laughs> oh, it worked. Uh, <laughs> show the, to show that the raise hand worked if you clicked in participants. Great. You are blessed with hands that raise. <laughs> Although I'm part of, I'm part of Hillary's are what we call Tuesday for the Birds group, which, mm. you know, we used to, with East Bay Regional Parks, we sort of partnered with them. It was awesome right now because of COVID, it's not really happening, but, but Hillary, thank you. This was absolutely wonderful on behalf of Tuesday for the Birds. Oh, yes, I'm, I'm a very happy member of that. I have my, I have my hand up too. Those trips. Oh, we have another hand up. Um, well, see. maybe Mitch should go before me. And then I'll I'll go after Mitch. No, no, I can wait, please. I think okay. you're before me. Uh, Hillary, if you were to take some children down to the lake, let's say first or second graders, mm -hmm. what would you have them look for, um, or what would you hope to see at this particular time in March, like the whole like month of March, from what you've seen in previous months of March. I think that they would really enjoy learning the difference between greater and lesser scout. You go down to the nature center and that, that little bulge in the, in, the, uh, in the walkway right in front of that, a lot of scout come in there. And so you can see them really close and the idea that these are two completely different kinds of birds, but they look almost identical. But if you look really carefully, you can tell them one from the other. And they're all boys. Okay. All of those black and white ducks are boys. And do and they have yellow well. beaks? Hmm? Do they have yellow beaks? They have blue beaks. Blue beaks, okay. And one of the ways that you tell them apart is that at the end of their blue beak, a greater scalp has a greater amount of black. He's got a kind of smear like a mess. If that's his beak, the whole front of it will be black. Okay. And if it's a lesser scalp, he's got lesser amounts of black. And it's just got one little black nail that comes up the middle of it. Okay. Thank you. I've really enjoyed your talk today. Thank you very much. I really enjoy doing this. Uh, Mitch, do you, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Yes, and, th and thank you for doing this. Um, could you just briefly uh, talk about what you look for each season when it comes to birds that uh, are here only in particular seasons? Let's start with high summer. You know, in August, you're going to see Canada geese and coots, and maybe a grebe. You'll see the mallards. The mallards are always there. Most of them are domestic mallards, but they all, you know, most of them have got the coloring of wild mallards. Very thin of company on the lake in the middle of the summer. Uh, you, but you will have pelicans there. The, the lake isn't white pelican habit, habitat. And so Hank always gets, look, gets looking for a mate around this time of year if you go down there. You'll see that you're starting to grow a bump on beak. And every year Hank hopes, hopes that somebody will stay. But along about April, they're gone. But by the middle of the summer, you might have 30 white pelicans out there coming down to, to visit Hank. They're coming back from the breeding grounds. Uh, where are the grilled ducks, somebody asks. The grilled ducks are down at the other end of the lake towards El Barcadero. The, the males are always a little gutsier and they'll come up and scavenge. But anyway, getting back to the year, 
the summer there's nothing. Along you start getting the the pipe billed greaves will come in around September. Maybe you'll see them earlier in the summer. By the end of October is when you're starting to look for the winter ducks. That's when the, the ruddy ducks usually show up first and then the scalp. And into November, you're getting golden eye. We get two kinds of golden eyes here. Only one is much, much rarer the other, than the other. And it's kind of amusing most of the time when a bird is called a common something or another. A common yellow throat. Yeah, right. Wait till you see a yellow throat. But with the common golden eye, you actually get many more of them than of the barrow's golden eyes. I think that a lot of it is that many of the birds that, have, that are called common, whatever it is, are European birds. And they just don't show up here. So we occasionally get one and they go, oh, look, there's a common, whatever it is. But it's not common here at all. The high season for birds, November, December, January, February, into March, that's when everybody who's going to come is here. All the golden eyes, you get the, the you get the rest of the grebes in the middle of the winter. I was just reading about the eared grebes, which at this season of the year, they're sort of gray powder puffs with dark gray necks, little bitty heads with bright red beady eyes on them. They're really cute. And you start seeing them, they, they come in the winter, they leave in May after they put on their party clothes. And an eared grebe looks like it came out of a jewelry shop. You know, they're, they're beaten steel and copper and bright gold. They've got these gold fans by the eyes. But it turns out that when they leave, they go to the Great Salt Lake and they go to Mono Lake where they can eat, neat, 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 get build up the, you know, they build up the energy for, to there. And then when they, when they go to fly back to the West, when they get ready to fly from the lake back to the west coast, their digestive system shrivels up. And all of the power, all of the, their, their, their wing muscles get big. I mean, you know, imagine if you could redesign yourself. Oh, I'm getting too fat. I shall shrink my stomach down. <laughs> and now I have only half an intestine left. But then they don't eat on the flight. They have to build up enough fat to get them across. And then when they land, they get rid of the flight muscles. They grow their tummies back so they can eat. Hmm. See, Mitch, I think I got distracted, but you know, that's, you know, you get the, the winter birds and the summer birds. Mm -hmm. Which bird travels the farthest to club bird at Lake Merritt? Oh, that's an interesting question. <sighs> I know that the scalp are going up into the Arctic someplace. My knowledge is shallow rather than deep. I've got a whole collection of fun facts, but if something isn't one of my fun facts, I don't actually know it. I have looked up <laughs> where the birds where the birds breed, and if you get, you might notice that I'm really quite fond of David Sibley. I like his art. I like the way he presents information, but. In the regular bird books, there are range maps, of which I'm not sure that's going to show up well enough to actually see it. But they tell for each species of bird, he tells you where it is at each season of the year oh. and when you're likely to see it where. This is the big Sibley. There's a Sibley birds of, of Western North America, which is small enough to carry around. This darling thing, my sister gave me for Christmas years ago, and I use it all the time. It lives on my desk. But these things can be looked up. It's just that they don't stick in my head. Wow. Catherine says, we've got posters at the, nature, at the Rotary Nature Center, and there are range maps on them. To take a better look at that next time I'm down there. Anybody else? I have a hand. I'm going to go up. 
I just wanted to make a shout out, if I can, to um, St. Paul's School that has been monitoring the birds at Lake Merritt probably since 2000 or before 2000 with um, young children. They have a little scorecard that they've developed uh, for what species are present and they have Boku data on the uh, presence of cool. birds during the school year anyway um, at Lake Merritt. So, I mean, Oakland is a, you know, nature loving, citizen science loving city. And it would be really great if the nature center could be like a hub where we could share some of that information with everybody. So um, thank you, St. Paul's for your service all these years. Uh, well, if we, um, if we are a little bit, we could try in the last 10 minutes or so to run a few more um, trivia questions. We actually have a few more. Um, is there interest? Um, I'm seeing the gallery view. Um, you can put on a smile if you would like to do trivia or Hillary, if you take it away, if you'd like, if you think of something you'd like to talk about. This has just been an amazing opportunity to talk to you. Well, you know, I'm always happy to talk about, about my friends here. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I see a this lot was of people. the first time I tried to make a really large creature. This is a life-sized <laughs> ivory built woodpecker. Mm. Those are amazing. How do you do it? There's a steel frame and then the, the, the wool is built up to shape and then the a color layer, a layer of colored wood provided on top. The, the beaks always move if I'm doing birds, which isn't all that often. I make the eyes. Amazing. The eyes are also wool that's been dipped in lacquer to give it that proper eye-like shine. If you go to salamanderfeltworks.com, you'll see some, there are photo essays there of things being made. This is the creature that was on the hat during the video. <laughs> what a cute it's a lesser jerboa. My question is, do you live in an area, I can't think of the name, it's like, it begins with the letter M. I hate having a concussion. I'm, uh, in, I'm in what's called Adams Point. Oh gosh. Do you sell your, are these made out of felt, wool? Yeah. They're made out of wool. They're made, actually, when you, when you make something of felt, you're not making it out of felt, you're making it into felt. Got it. It starts out as just unspun wool. Exactly. And as you work it, it gets solid. I understand. Thank you for that. I, I put them up for adoption. <laughs> what got me into making creatures? Well, I've always I've made I've made creatures since I was a very tiny child. Whatever I could get my hands on got made into a creature. <laughs> and I discovered all of this medium. Thanksgiving Day 2009. I was at my nephew's house for Thanksgiving dinner and got roped into helping with a project for the kids Waldorf school and from there just it ate my life. Uh -huh. Oh Lila's here cool hi Lila. How can we adopt one of your all of the photographers? Ooh. Just uh, the people who took the bird pictures. Uh, Lee Oreck. I had some of Mark Rosen's shots. They're just people. We have some of the most amazing bird photographers in this area.
And Lila is, as I said before, the absolute queen of telephone video. Anybody else? How can we uh, adopt one of your creatures? <laughs> now, write to me via email. And okay, go to the website and see somebody speaks to you now. There are many, many creatures that are looking for homes. Or if you, so you get in touch with, with me about one of those, or if you've got a pet or a favorite animal or something that you don't see there. I also do commission stuff. I just made a new hatchling California condor for somebody. Oh. That's, that's the latest thing on the website. Wow. Well, we are coming close. Go ahead. Um, I, I just wanted to mention we are coming close to the uh, hard end of our program. Um, Hillary, I'll, I'll let you have um, the penultimate word, and then I'd like to, to say something before saying, waving goodbye to everyone. Um, so um, go ahead, Hillary. Okay. I was just, yeah, thank you, Kathy. I was just going to give the website, but Lila has happily typed, typed it into the chat. That, that's where you can go and see the creatures. Fantastic. So um, over to you. Yeah, I'd like to encourage everyone to, uh, if you're on Facebook, to look for Rotary Nature Center Friends. Uh, we post photos of our activities, and if we have a cleanup at the Rotary Nature Center grounds or a restoration activity along the shoreline where we're um, planting native uh, marsh plants along the shore of Lake Merritt, um, you can hook up with that, uh, those activities there and see what we're doing. Um, and so, uh, we um, really appreciate um, your sharing the word and uh, if we put something up that you like to share it. Um, our, go ahead, I hear, I hear somebody speaking, could possibly be David Wofford, correct? No, okay. <laughs> um, so uh, we also have a website which is uh, linked on the Eventbrite um, messages that we sent out, which also shows some of our activities. And we're just really thrilled to people are so interested in the lake, um, the nature at the lake and bringing together the people in our community to support the lake and, um, and the, to learn about our place in nature. So um, any final comments by any of my colleagues? David, go for it. Uh, yes, I would like to say something. Uh, Hillary, it's been such a pleasure having you join us. <clears throat> this evening, forgive me. For Thank some you. reason, I've got a sore throat, Aww. and I've been unable to uh, to eat very much. So my stomach is rather empty, but my soul is filled, uh, and my mind is filled with all that you shared with us this evening. And for me, it's been it, it's kind of a it's a a long arc here, <laughs> uh, coming from a real not paying attention to birds and unable to perceive um, these kinds of things and the differences. And so through this work, I've come a long way, but uh, tonight has been absolutely fascinating. And I can't wait to digest it all and share it with other people. So thank you, Hillary. And of course, thank- uh, Oh, you're very welcome. That's wonderful to hear. And of course, thank all of our audience. I was so amazed at the uh, trivia questions and the other questions and how knowledgeable <laughs> uh, so many of you are. Uh, and I just really appreciated the, the back and forth and the conversation. And of course, Katie and team, thank you guys so much, Rob and everyone else, Janice, Betsy, Kirsten, for putting all this together. <clears throat> I look forward to seeing everybody next, uh, next month at the Fifth Lakeside chat where we'll talk trash. <laughs> <laughs> Hillary, is it fair to say that um, the next um, bird walk, um, the unofficial bird walk is on March 25th, is that correct? March. Oh. Well, no, it's the 24th. 24th. That's right. It's the fourth right. Wednesday. 
So I knew I would get it wrong. Okay, I really appreciate that. So everybody, it is on the 24th and uh, you can uh, see information about, read about um, Hillary's walks in the Tidings newsletter, which is available at uh, lakemeritinstitute.org. Uh, you can go back through the years and, and learn a lot about birds from her columns. Hey. Yes. I'm sorry, can I ask Hillary? Hillary, a lot of um, visitors to the lake ask me um, what the um, noise impact and the people, the, the crowd impact is on the birds. Um, do you have any particular tidbits to say in reference to that? I really don't because you know we have people there and we have birds there and there doesn't seem to be <laughs> What is one of the wonderful things about Lake Merritt is that the birds there don't worry about the people. I've been in places where you couldn't get within a half a block of a black crowned night heron. It sees you coming and it's gone. And at Lake Merritt, they'll sit on your park bench and eat your sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> it's the oldest bird sanctuary in the country and the birds seem to know. I'm sure they would be happier if it was quieter some of the times when it gets very loud, but it doesn't seem to affect them that much. Okay, with that, everybody, um, let's all give it up. Uh, let's unmute ourselves and give it up for Hillary tonight for a fantastic virtual bird walk. You can all unmute okay. and clap your hands. Thank you, Hillary. It was awesome. We hope to see you all next time. <laughs> uh, we have a wonderful uh, talk planned um, for the um, for uh, this right the ninth of April. So with that, I'm going to um, say goodbye to everyone and uh, see you next time. Thank you, everyone, for everything. Okay. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.